<laughs> Statement 21. <clears throat> People claim that due to the particulars of Mahayana and Hinayana, there is a difference as to the fields where one gathers the accumulations. <clears throat> uh, then Kyopa's statement, whether one has a high or low ability, it is a profound vital point to select the higher field of merit. Yeah, so here, um, honestly, um, when you look at these two statements, uh, it's still unclear, you know, like uh, what, what some statements, you know, quite clear, you, you see like, okay, he is stating the opposite viewpoint. Here, it's not so obvious uh, that he is stating the opposite viewpoint, so to say. But let's see. Okay. This has two aspects. Ah, so, you know, Chodot tells us. Uh, there, there are two aspects here. Intention, uh, or can also be translated as notion, and thing. A lower field is not a proper object for the gathering of accumulations. So uh, this uh, Nagarjuna's text, uh, due to his wrong views, a person will possess the unbearable ripening of all his deeds, even though his conduct is good. If one can find only an inferior field of merit, one can transform it through one's intention or notion. It is like the case in which a bodhisattva had previously become an elephant and some hunters wearing saffron colored garments shot him with arrows. Thus, taking the garment of the hunters as the reason, the elephant offered tusks and life and forming the aspiration of a pure mind, he made the cause he made that the cause for awakening. May these few gifts be free from one who accepts them and be free too from one who offers them. And thus, since this is therefore an excellent object produced from my mind, may it be a perfect effort. So this is the story of how um, some hunters, uh, they were trying to catch this elephant uh, and hunt the elephant uh, to, uh, you know, uh, cut the tusks to make ivory and also to take some of the parts uh, of the elephant. And so they're wanting to hunt and kill the elephant. Uh, but unsuccessful many times. And then someone pointed out to them that uh, elephants tend to uh, be friendly um, towards monks. So then these hunters put on uh, monks' robes and tricked this elephant uh, to not be afraid of them. And then they shot him. Uh, but even though he was shot, uh, this elephant, by these hunters pretending to be monks, uh, even though he realized that, oh, these are not monks, uh, these are hunters. But in the elephant's mind, it is said, he continued to think of them as monks, sincerely, and then offered his life, the tusk in his life, as an offering to the Sangha, and made this Bodhisattva vow. And he said that because of that, you know, the effect is actually. So this is what I was talking about last class. That Jigen Sumgan says, you know, offering to a Buddha is infinitely more powerful than offering to ordinary. But you can bring the two together. My hospital and stupa thing, you know. Uh, that we talked about in the last class. So this is uh, the example here. <clears throat> mm. 
Furthermore, earlier when Jigden Gumpu dwelt as a supportive spiritual teacher in Pamodru, so at Pamodrupa's monastery, after I think this is referring to when Pamodrupa passed away. He understood <clears throat> the notion of the whole assembly as a bunch of adulterers. <laughs> so there was a point. This, this I'm not very sure exactly when, but but in Jigdeng Sumgun's uh, biography, it is said that um, at various point when he was at his teacher's monastery, where there were a lot of monks there, at least one occasion. I don't know if this is the same occasion. Uh, because of the negative behavior of uh, one of the kind of monks there, not not like a like someone who has you know some position and reputation, because of that he started to have a very critical uh, eye towards everyone there. Because of the negative behavior of one person, and then he started to have a very critical. Uh, so. Throughout his biography, it said that he was very arrogant, Jigen uh, Sumgan. Not arrogant in the completely worldly way, uh, but it's due to that, you know, samsaric arrogance. But the arrogance comes out in the shape of like, you know, he's like, I'm a better practitioner than all of these guys. Uh, also partly the reason why he did not want to become a monk. Uh, it's sort of like saying, you know, uh, if you, you guys, if you guys are monks, you know, the way you, uh, I don't need this monk thing. <laughs> so in this case, you know, because of Geshe Samyepa's bad behavior, then he started to think uh, these are all yeah, people who don't keep their celibacy vows uh, behind the guru's backs. They're doing all kinds of funny things. Uh, so then this became an obstacle, became an impediment. And then when he realized that, uh, continuing here, he visualized the protector of beings meaning his guru, Pamadrupa, on the crown of the head of each member of the community, seeing them as tantric deities, and he vowed to bestow on them the seven branches of offering. Thereby, in such a manner, it occurs that there is first an artificial manner, and finally, an ultimate respectful devotion. Yeah? So this is another example. So he fixed that problem uh, by, you know, once he recognized that, oh, this has now become an obstacle for me. Uh, I'm walking around every day here, uh, seeing everyone with these critical eyes. Oh, they are all a bunch of vow breakers, and all of this. Then he said, oh, this needs to be fixed. So instead, uh, he visualized his guru above the head of every person in that community. And he visualized each of them as tantric deities. And so the artificial manner in which he artificially, he, he, he know, like, right, on the relative level, yeah, they are misbehaving. But then he used an artificial manner, which is to force himself to look at them and visualize his guru above each of them and each of them to be like deities. Then ultimate respectful devotion arose. Remember this phrase, right? Ultimate devotion. Elsewhere, we know that ultimate devotion is not some sort of like emotional stuff. Like, oh, but the ultimate devotion is seeing Dharmakaya. So he saw the innate, pristine nature First, it was artificial, right? He's just imputing on them. He's projecting on them. So that, that is an improvement from going about finding fault. He, he projected on them as deities. But then that finally led to really being able to see that, oh, yes, these are all, their nature is all Buddha. So this is the intention part, uh, notion part. Uh, Chodak says there are two, two, two points here. Uh, 
two aspects. Now the thing part. Secondly, on the instruction concerning the thing. So quoting one tantric text, Chatupita Samuchaya, it says, one makes offerings in particular to the different fields of merit, such as the Buddha fields. 2,000 common people are like a single pure Brahmin. 2,000 pure Brahmins correspond to a single fully ordained monk. 2,000 fully ordained monks match a single stainless one. 2,000 stainless one yeah, match a single possessor of gnosis. 2,000 possessors of gnosis equal a single master. Having thus analyzed the fields of offerings, those endowed with intelligence permanently make offerings. Through the yoga that is the dharma of the virtuous roots, one plants, one plants the seed in the fertile field. So here it's saying, you know, yes, one aspect of, of when we talk about how to accumulate yeah, this merit or accumulate gnosis, mm, one pertains to actually, are they or are they not? That's the thing. The other aspect is our own uh, mm, view of them. That these two needs to be taken into consideration uh, is what uh, the Chodra seems to be saying. And thus there are Vajra masters who are described as possessing one, two, Oh, hold on, back up. Concerning the Vajra master of, of mentioned here, uh, then another tantric, uh, another tantra, uh, Krishna Yamari, uh, the black uh, Yamantaka um, text says, there are six types of Vajra masters, reading the excellent dharma, bestowing it, bestowing explanations, revealing instructions, bestowing empowerments, and performing mandala activities and thus there are vajra masters who are described as possessing one two three and so forth of these abilities therefore in the practice tradition of the precious kagyu we maintain that the supreme of all fields of merit is the excellent glorious guru that is the supreme essence of the practice tradition the reason has been thus presented So it says, you know, here, according to the Kagyu tradition, uh, the excellent, glorious Guru. Uh, so the Vajra master that has all six of these qualities, or these six abilities, they know the Dharma. And they can transmit the Dharma. And they can transmit the Dharma with explanations. And they can cause the student to reveal the instructions means you know cause the students to actually get understand the pith instructions the essence instructions and they are capable of bestowing empowerments and performing mandala activities means the various aspects of that practice and so here is saying uh, there are two issues here. We should not just think, oh, it's all up to you, how you think of it. If you look at the story of the elephant, if you just think, oh, that is it. Here, Chodra's point is, Chitin Sumgan also says, but that, that's not the whole thing. That is an important point, how you view, just like because the elephant view his murderers as monks. The elephant benefited. Of course, those murderers that pretended to be monks, their karma is also very heavy. But insofar as the elephant experiencing what happened, it became beneficial to the elephant. So here the statement is saying, but there is a difference between hunters pretending to be monks and actual monks. You should not say, oh, it's all just up to the perceiver. So that seems to be this point here. So let's look at 
these notes here. I think these notes are good to look at because uh, uh, not so much, you know, uh, philosophical arguments. This is really showing us some of the more detailed uh, understanding we need to have uh, in terms of how uh, uh, we we look at uh, these uh, this issue of uh, who we uh, um, offers opportunities for us to uh, gain uh, to to progress you know to gain to to gather uh, as I say you know accumulation is an unfortunate uh, translation but it has become very common. For some of us, it has it, it turns us off, you know, to think that oh, I have to accumulate merit, I have to accumulate gnosis, you know. And some of us think that oh, this is all so uh, materialistic, you know. But 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 you know, we cannot just because we we're not comfortable with this word accumulation, you know, we cannot change Buddha's teachings. Buddha taught very clearly, you know, if we don't gather all the necessary. We're either gathering confusion or we're gathering clarity, so to say. We're either gaining more confusion or we're gaining more clarity. And the way to get, gain more clarity is to gather merit and gnosis. So here notes, concerning the field, meaning the object toward which one directs the activities of accumulation, such as offering gifts. Some people claim that there exists a difference between Mahayana and Hinayana. And they hold that the Bodhisattvas who dwell on the stages of the path and have entered the Bodhisattva's conduct must hold dear uh, the three inferior objects. That is, they practice by holding sentient beings dearer than the Buddha because it is their task to benefit beings, holding that which is not excellent dearer than what is excellent, and holding harming themselves dearer than benefiting themselves. In other words, those who have the highest capacity have to select a lower field of accumulation. Ah, So this is an important explanation here. Otherwise, it's hard to understand what, what the other view is saying. So according to the other view, which up until now, the explanation seems very reasonable, right? Uh, this is also based on like Shantideva saying, you know, uh, telling us how we have to really view that, you know, between Buddhas uh, and evildoers, mm -hmm. from one perspective, uh, the kindness of the evildoers are even more than the kindness of Buddhas. <laughs> From one perspective. Yeah, because if we don't have evil doers, so to say, we cannot polish this diamond. If you don't have very good sandpaper, I don't know what they use, you know, or the, another diamond, very sharp to cut, you cannot, you know, purify the diamond. So from that perspective, it seems that like then those beings, the lower field, uh, the more afflicted they are, the more precious they are to bodhisattvas. Yeah, it makes sense, you know, from that context. Yeah. But I, I would say, you know, there Shantideva is actually yeah, trying to help us yeah, to see in what way, yeah, uh, those conditions and situations that we habitually label as undesirable and not helpful can actually be very helpful yeah. in so far as polishing the diamond is concerned. Uh, but here, uh, Jigden Simgun wants to say, uh, that's, that's not the whole picture. We need to consider this further. So here, continuing. All three commentaries, uh, here is referring to the two earliest one, Dorshema, Rinjangma, and now Chudra, the third. Uh, 
All three commentaries agree that it is necessary to examine the field of merit and to select a higher field or to take a lower field and transform it into a higher field through the purity of one's mind. The commentaries explain this point in two steps, first regarding the notion and then regarding the thing. So here, all three commentaries say, Jigden Zimgen says, you should select the higher field or take a lower field, and that means a lower object, and raise it, elevate that through the purity of your own perception. First, regarding the notion, Doja Sherab explains how faults arise. He says that someone with little merit is, quote, blocked through the perverted views of his own mental continuum. When he gathers merit on the field of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but perceives them as ordinary beings, faults occur. So with these, with these who have very little merit, even when they are offering to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, he, he, he looks at them, you know, in, with such a, perceive them as ordinary. And therefore, you know, faults occur. In that case, two things happen. One, merit arises due to quality of the field of merit, which is Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then faults arise due to one's perverted views that prevent one from perceiving the purity of the field. So in agreement with the principle of separate and unmixed results, both results arise. So this is an important point. This is taking an earlier point made about how karma uh, ripen unmistakably. Yeah. So if you help, if you make offering to a Buddha, uh, but you look down on the Buddha, the Buddha's own merit will ensure uh, that you, your action of helping that Buddha will produce corresponding merit. But your not seeing that Buddha as Buddha, or even worse, maybe seeing that as, you know, uh, someone you just need to help, hmm? that you would you want to be away from it hmm? as soon as possible. That fault will arise from there. In general, karmic fruition has many principles. According to Jigden Sumgun, some examples are the inevitability of karmic retribution. So this, these four summary is very good for us to remember. For Jigden Sumgun, he says, you have to remember these things. Uh, these, these list of four, right? It's not the exhaustive, it's not, you know, it's not all that is to be said. Uh, is this, this is sobish. Um, mm kind of summarizing for us. And this is not, a, not necessarily a traditional list. And the rule that good results derive from good actions and bad results from bad actions. The results arise separately and unmixed. That the form of a karmic result is dependent on the quality and power of the intention and on the quality of the field. Concerning the latter point, if one commits, for instance, non-virtuous acts with regard to a high field of merit, such as a Buddha, the negative retribution will be strong. And if one performs a virtuous act, if one performs virtuous acts, the positive retribution will also be strong. The Dorshema and the Rinjangma explain that some former masters taught that the Bodhisattva should take sentient beings and not the Buddha as their field of merit. In that case, however, 
three faults might result. The Bodhisattva unskillfully inflicts harm upon himself for the sake of beings. He harms the teachings of the Buddha because he fails to hold the Buddha precious. The power of the poisonous afflictions increases because he is attached to sentient beings. So here it's saying, even though, yes, from a certain perspective, Buddhas or sentient beings should be seen as more precious than Buddhas. So this is like the eight verses mind training. It says that, you know, you should hold sentient beings as even more precious than the wish-fulfilling jewel. Often we call Buddhas wish-fulfilling jewel. We call our guru wish-fulfilling jewel. But there in the Lojong teachings, it says, you know, sentient beings are even more precious than wish-fulfilling jewels. Here, Jiktan Simgun is reminding us, okay, not literally, okay? <laughs> if we literally believe that, we run the risk of these three, uh, these three uh, problems, uh, that these three faults that might result, uh, which is you unskillfully harm yourself for the sake of beings. There will be times where you might have to harm yourself for the sake of beings. But if you do it you know, without clear understanding, if you do it out of like, you know, uh, ego, it will backfire. Or you might harm the teachings of the Buddha because now you're like, oh, sentient beings are so precious. You know, Buddhas, uh, who cares? Uh, or, you know, you think sentient beings are so precious, you know, and then it easily turns into attachment, uh, grasping sentient beings. So those are the three problems we have to guard against. Therefore, one must not have impure notions of the field while gathering merit. Uh, so meaning, uh, even though uh, primarily you might be uh, helping, assisting sentient beings, yeah, because, you know, you can recognize they need more help from me than Buddhas. But don't forget, you know, in terms of qualities, what Buddha qualities are. Well, of course, in some ways, you can say, well, Buddhas don't exist, or at least the way that Buddha Shakyamuni existed then. So you won't have, you know, Buddha knocking on your door. Uh, then you don't have to make the choice, you know, should I feed the Buddha or should I feed, you know, the homeless people? But then, of course, in Vajrayana, there is the Guru. <laughs> so that complicates things a little. Yeah. Uh, anyway, therefore, one must not have the impure notions of the field while gathering merit. Another aspect of this method is that one can thereby transform an inferior field of merit. So Dojasharap explains, due to the vital point of all phenomena of samsara and nirvana being one's mind, things arise as they are established in agreement with one's mind. Therefore, having blessed one's mind as being pure, bless here means train, okay? trained by recognition that your mind is pristine. There exists a system in which even though one makes an offering to a low field, it turns into an offering to the Buddha. Such a skillful purification of the mind and subsequent transformation of the field has powerful consequences. So Dojasharap continues, he says, all high and low results are established by one's pure or impure mind. When one's, pure, one's mind is pure, one can see that even though the mental continuum has faults like a mountain and not even a quality as tiny as a sesame seeds, one's quality covers their fault. When one's mind is not pure, one can see that even though one's field of offering has qualities like a mountain and only the tiniest fault comparable to a sesame seeds, one's fault covers 
their qualities. And this is very nice. <laughs> it's saying, you know, even if, you know, you're actually giving to someone or helping someone uh, or respecting someone with qualities like a mountain and faults only the size of a sesame seed, uh, your own mental uh, uh, afflictions uh, are going to mess that up. On the other hand, you know, even if they have faults like a mountain and only qualities like a sesame seed, the quality of your pure mind can cover their fault. <laughs> so it seems like, at least at this point, between the field, the status of the field, and the status of your intention, the status of your intention is more important. But without forgetting that on the field side, it does make a difference. So this I would relate to something like, you know, sometimes we say, oh, if your mind is pure, you know, any teacher would be good. But sometimes when you take that too far, then people use that to excuse bad behavior. As if there's no difference between, you know, the qualities that actually exist in some teachers compared to others then we are like confusing things. Yeah? So here, to me, what this is saying, yes, primarily it's still working on our perception. But that doesn't mean, you know, there's no difference between relying on Shakyamuni Buddha, for example, and relying on eh, an ordinary being. Yeah. There is a difference. Continuing here, uh, whether one's field of offering is a Buddha or a beggar, the faults of the field can be outshone by the purity of one's mind. But an impure mind can spoil even the most excellent field. So Dojja Sherap says, quoting Pamudrupa, the great meditator practicing love view all enemies as father and mother. The great meditator with the stable cultivation stage, views all receptacles and contents as mandala and deity. A cultivation stage is often trans more, more commonly translated as generation stage or creation stage. Now, these are the two stages of uh, highest yoga tantra meditation uh, of deity practice. Uh, so for, for a great meditator with a stable generation stage, he views, he or she views all receptacles and content as mandala and deity. Receptacle is talking about the physical world. It's able to see the environment as mandala and all the contents, all the beings as deities. The great meditator who practices luminosity, this is a reference to completion stage, without bias realizes everything as dharmakaya. An example of the above is an advanced bodhisattva who has taken birth as an elephant. When he perceives some hunters clad in saffron color as the Buddha, he transforms the inferior field of merit, i.e. hunters, into a superior one, the Buddha, and offers his tusk and his life. Dojo Sherab adds, thus even such a mighty one of the ten stage with great mental capacity must establish purity to select field. Ah, so here Doja Sherab is actually saying, you know, like in the end, huh, it's establishing your purity of view huh, 
and selecting the field. So back to last class, I said, you know, view uh, all these beings that need our help, that need help the most, view them as Buddhas and offer them our help. And in that way also, you know, we, we want to like help others from this superiority complex. I'm better than them, so I'm helping them. Oh, these helpless, oh, pity them. Or maybe helping like uh, disrespectfully. But cultivating, you know, seeing them as Buddhas. And really, you know, helping and making that offering. In his detailed biography of the Drigumpa, uh, the Drigumpa is <laughs> Chikden Sumgan. <laughs> many names, Kenchen Rinpoche also pointed out, <laughs> many names and talking about the same person. <laughs> Sobish here, you know, even uh, as a Western writer. Has, has become Tibetan, you know, <laughs> sometimes using this name, sometimes using that name. <laughs> In his detailed biography of, of, of Jigden Sumgun, Sharab Jungne mentions the story of Jigden Sumgun and Geshe Samyepa. The Geshe offered Jigden Sumgun a low price for a pair of saddlebags. Ah, so this is a specific story. Since the Geshe was one of Pamudrupa's very best students, Jigden Sumgun momentarily lost faith in the entire Sangha. Yeah? So he saw one of Jigden uh, Pamudrupa's stellar disciples uh, take advantage of him. You know? So probably Jigden Sumgun needed some money and said, you know, I have this saddle, uh, this saddle, this pair of saddle bags uh, that I need to sell. And this, this, you know. Uh, important student, you know, which is Densen Gun, you know, think, oh, must be such a kind person, must be such a generous person. You know, he's such a close disciple of Pamodrupa. But instead, you know, seemingly this guy is taking advantage of him, you know, saying, you know, you really need money? I'll buy it for half what, of what it's worth. <laughs> so then Jig Densen Gun got very upset. So upset that he thinks, you know, ah, wow, uh, if one of the best students uh, this Lama has behaves like that, you know, then uh, what to say about the rest of them, right? <laughs> but understanding that this was an impediment, he artificially cultivated the notion of his fellow students uh, as uh, tantric deities with the teacher in the form of the Buddha seated on the crowns of their heads. He performed prostrations to them and the sevenfold offering to all of them. He later said that in, it is generally necessary to first cultivate a pure notion in an artificial manner, which through training will finally turn into ultimate respectful devotion. Fake it until you make it. Not fake it until other people make it, okay? Sometimes that's what we're doing. We fake it, hoping that other people will change. Oh, I will treat this person with so pure vision. Yeah, they're going to change. And then I'm going to like them. No, no. You are going to change. Fake it until you make it. Not fake it until other people make it. Here, he skillfully transformed the lower field of merit into a superior field of merit, namely his fellow students into tantric deities. The second aspect of the present discussion is supposed to be the thing, the field. Remember the three, the field, the intention, and the thing. So the thing that one offers to the field of merit the explanation, however, so, so Sobish points out, refers to the actual field to which one offers a thing. So the explanation is using thing and field 
sort of like as one thing. In short, <laughs> so says, in short, the thing is best offered to the highest fuel of merit, which here the commentary says, the Vajra master who is one's guru. Um, I have to say that in Chodak's commentary, uh, the two points are not exactly brought together, I feel, uh, in a way that is so clear. I don't know about you, but uh, I think even so, so much here, you know, is expressing that in a very polite way uh, with this last, it just, he spends most of it uh, explaining the first part of the two parts, right? Chodak says there are two parts. Uh, one is your intention, your view, your mind. And the other thing is the status of who you're giving. And then by extension, you can say what you're giving. So even though between the three, right, you, uh, your intention, your perception, then the field, uh, the object that you are offering to, and then the thing that you're offering, uh, it seems like of the three it is saying, the most important is the first one. But the other two are still important. Don't, don't think, you know, oh, just the first is important. So that's to me, is the take home lesson. Uh, for, for this, this line here, this statement here. Don't just think, you know, it's just me. It's just the perceiver. It's just here that I have to fix. There is also the need to consider who you're giving to and what you're giving to. In a mundane context, you know, it's like the expression that I, I, I often joke about. People say, it's the thought that counts. When do you use that expression, it's the thought that counts? Tell me. When you come up short. Ah, when you come up short. <laughs> or often when someone else comes up short, you want to console them, you say to them, oh, it's the thought that counts. Right? <laughs> Hopefully you don't come up short and you say to someone, it's the thought that counts, you know? <laughs> That's not so effective, you know? I find it applies when you're making a trivial offering to a uh -huh. relatively uh, great uh, situation. Right, you're right. I mean, you're, yeah, you're offering you might really say that. Make a difference. Yeah, you might say that, you know, it's the thought that counts, right? But actually, if you say that, you know, if, 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 you, if you say that, right, to me, what it highlights then is not much thought has gone into this. It can cut both ways. So this is also what it's saying here. I, I feel. Yeah. So yes, of course, it's the thought that counts. But if you have really thought about it, it will come out differently. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you know. If you, say that, yes. You're defending what you know is an inferior offering. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, for, for the receiver to, to genuinely maybe not just politely, but generally say it's a thought that counts. That's a good training. This is like the Bodhisattva purifying our intention, saying to the other person, oh, it's the thought that counts. If you can genuinely say that, then this is a good thing. But often it's our politeness we say to someone, oh, it's the thought that counts. But I tell you, you know, if this person keeps doing that, you know, your husband, your partner, or whatever keeps one of these days, you're going to like bang them over the head and say, You have not given much thought to this. <laughs> right? The husband that buys the wife, you know, things to uh, use to make his life better. Oh, here, I got you a vacuum cleaner. Oh, here, you know, I, I got you a food processor. Oh, here, you know, I got you a, a golf 
pass for me so that I'm gone more than you don't have to deal with me. <laughs> it's true. It's the thought that counts. Then you know what to count now. Likewise, you know, so this is not saying, this is not saying, you know, like, oh, you have to give the best, the most expensive. Also, sometimes not much thought has gone into that. And manipulative thoughts. I'm going to give this, you know, we call it the burden of the gift. Sometimes we manipulate people like that. You know, we have expectations. It comes with strings tied upside down tight until you know we give like that then oh, of course it's the thought that counts right <laughs> we know what the thought is behind that act oh then it's very heavy very uncomfortable it comes with a lot of weight and they say don't accept that kind of gift So we will end here today. Statement 22 is very interesting, but uh, this will we'll reserve for Wednesday. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, any questions, comments further? Uh, Dr. Lai? Yes. Uh, one thing about the uh, field of merit. Mm -hmm. uh, the everyday example of a beggar approaching or someone asking for money or something like that. Mm -hmm. The fact is, we don't know whether the person's a Buddha or not. Mm -hmm. So Yes, there's that there's, aspect, sure. So if we just see the person as a nuisance, we're automatically selecting a lower field of merit for our yes. offering to the person. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. We have selected a lower field by our own making. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chan Chu Sam Chu Rimpu Chi Ma Ge Ba Nam Ge Gyu Chi Ge Ba Nyam Pa Me Ba Yan Gong Ne Gong Du Okay, see you all Wednesday. Thank you. Uh -huh. And tomorrow cool. there is a new series starting uh, teaching to the Brazilians uh, principle and practice of Mahamudra, um, not Mahamudra, deity yoga. So if you're interested, you know, it will start at six uh, New York time, six o'clock New York time, uh, North Carolina time, six o'clock because Brazil is two hours ahead of us. So it's eight o'clock their time. So six o'clock our time in North Carolina. Uh, and uh, the it will be on Facebook. Uh, it will also be on Zoom. Uh, I will forward the Zoom information uh, to the WhatsApp group uh, for those of you who might be interested. Then of course, Wednesday, Jigong uh, Kirti Sangha meeting. Uh, it's 7 to 9 uh, New York time. And uh, yeah, okay, tough. Thank you.